booktube it's angie i figure i need to <laughs> get some uh good new content for you guys up on the channel um i'm starting to get the impression that <laughs> even my husband is getting used to uh the very infrequent uploads here lately i do have video content coming up the pike for you guys i have um, author discussions and uh, series discussions and um, I've got some um, you know when I used to do those like sort of roundup themed videos I did a lot of those uh, early on in my channel I have more of those coming up so there are there are videos coming I'm just getting I'm just it's taken me a little bit to uh, get back into the the swing of things I keep thinking I'm on the ball and then it disappears and but today has been pretty good um i told you guys if <laughs> given time uh that eventually i would come back around and i would get my shit together and um today i actually like bothered to put on some makeup i put on a shirt that was something other than one of my like bummy knock around the house t-shirts uh yeah i like i made an effort <laughs> so uh yeah i wanted to get back into that um start throwing those videos up so you're not just coming here and thinking, God, it's just book hauls like most other uh, booktube channels. Uh, no, there's actual like content here. <laughs> uh, so one of the ones I wanted to start with was this history book I talked about a while back. Uh, this is Snowstorm in August by Jefferson Morley. This is a nonfiction history. Um, the tag on it, the tagline on the cover says Washington City, Francis Scott Key, and the Forgotten Race Riot of 1835. And I thought this would be appropriate to talk about now since it's, it is Black History Month. I thought this would tie in nicely. There is a lot that is covered in this book that isn't, well, I mean, it is tied to the subject matter, but um, it's not just about the race riot, I guess I should say. There, um, there are sections that go back as far as like the development of the city of Washington DC itself and our founding fathers and all that. And then it <coughs> sort of looks into um, just the backgrounds of some of the key players in this race riot. So you get to know them a little bit before it gets into like the meat of the story. Uh, it, I will uh, post my written review down below because on my written review I tried to break it down. A little bit so that uh, people coming into this book will have a kind of a general gist of what all is covered but uh, if you're more of a video type person I will do a similar layout in this video so um, this book started as a, a Washington Post article I think that uh, Morley did in 2005 was it yes 2005 uh, and it you know, a lot of non-fiction history ends up being that way these days where uh, a writer will write something for a newspaper or a magazine article and people get really interested in the topic and then uh, it encourages them to expand on that idea and write something more in depth and that's the case here. So where to start with all this? I guess we'll start from the beginning. Uh, sounds very epic. It's not going to take that long. Um, but uh, some of the stuff they talk about as far as, uh, like I was saying, the, the start of Washington, D.C. itself and our founding fathers, uh, some of the stuff I found interesting was uh, they talk about, or I keep saying they, he, Jefferson Morley, it's the uh, habit. Um, Jefferson Morley talks about the story of how Washington, D.C. was picked as our nation's capital. Uh, it was originally called Washington City. And that wasn't the first pick for where to place our capital. There's a story in here about how uh, Alexander Hamilton, of, as a history nerd, I cringe to say it, but of, hit, of Broadway play fame now. <laughs> um, he, he was, uh, I believe, Secretary of Treasury at the time of um, the creating of the nation, I guess, the official creating of the nation where, you know, our cities were being put together and stuff after the, the War of Independence. He, I believe he was Secretary of Treasury and Thomas Jefferson, I think, was Secretary of State. And <clears throat> there's a story in here about how those two got together and Hamilton initially wanted the state to, the state capital be somewhere in Pennsylvania. And uh, Jefferson was like, 
see, here's the thing. Um, we racked up a lot of debt <laughs> with the War of Independence. Um, I mean, <laughs> hooray for us. It turned out <laughs> well on our end, but it, it was expensive. So I have a debt plan that we can fix it. But the problem is um, we need to get the northern members of Congress and the southern members of Congress on the same team, which you can imagine probably pretty tricky back in the day. <laughs> I mean, as much fighting as we have in Congress now, imagine back then. Uh, so uh, Jefferson says, in order for the Northerns to get on board with my plan and the Southerners to get on board with my plan, we need to have them agree to where to put this and this town. <laughs> I think in a general sort of way, he was saying that there were a lot of racists <laughs> in Congress at the time. This is not surprising for the day. But um, he was basically saying that he didn't see the Southerners really going for a more Northern area to put the capital. So he said, what if we put it somewhere around like the Virginia, Maryland area? It's still kind of in the South, but it has more of a Northern feel uh, so it's not like directly in South, you know, with bando music and everything. Uh, it, it, it's going to appeal more to the Northerners. And uh, it's also <laughs> an area where the banks are good. So that helps with um, economy and, and figuring out how to make this debt plan work. And also in that particular area that Jefferson was talking about, uh, slavery was still legal. <laughs> and I... <laughs> kind of cringed when I was reading this story because they said uh, Hamilton didn't really object to the idea. He did some good things, but he also okayed the continuation of slavery for the good of paying off a debt for the country. <laughs> uh, so that was disappointing. But <clears throat> that's what I was saying. Like there, There's stories in here about getting the country developed first in those early years, and then it sort of fast forwards to uh, the mid 1800s where we start getting into the stories involving the the more meat of the t of the book which is the race riot itself so fast forwarding to the 1830s uh, the big topic on everybody's mind that was being thrown around that was sort of the precursor to this race riot was colonization and there were people on both sides of the topic colonization was basically this idea that came about where people were suggesting that maybe the um, the recently freed slaves should be sent to a free colony back in Africa where they could set up as free people again. Basically saying that <laughs> all the black people can leave the US and start their own country back over there, their own community, basically. This would somehow fix all of the animosity that had come from um, freeing the slaves. And uh, you might be surprised, there were actually supporters for colonization from both the white and black communities. Uh, the, the more racist <laughs> leaning um, white citizens of the US, they kind of saw it as getting rid of a problematic headache where um, you know, they, they didn't like uh, the former slaves now being free. They still saw them as second-class citizens. So they found this idea of sending them back to Africa appealing. Also in the black community, there were people that uh, also were fans of the idea. Not everybody, but there were supporters because the, some people naturally <laughs> came out of slavery very embittered. Uh, towards the white race and they saw it as a way to just distance themselves from these people and s start over. But, like I said, not everybody supported it. And one of the people that was like, uh, no, <laughs> was this guy, Beverly Snow, who was one of the key players in this book. Uh, Beverly Snow was a biracial uh, former slave who uh, ended up becoming a, a restaurateur, a chef, he started as a, um, what do you call it? Uh, in today's society, he would probably be known as like a, a food truck vendor. He would uh, just basically be a food vendor outside of uh, 
sporting events, which at the time he was developing his business in uh, Washington DC, horse racing had become very popular in the area and so he would set up his cart outside of anywhere he heard there was going to be a horse racing ring and uh, over time developed a clientele that way. And then once he got some money there, um, uh, this didn't happen overnight, this took time, but once he had some money set aside he set up the first, I think it was the first oyster shop in DC and he became um, one of the first or if not the first to introduce fine dining experiences to DC. Things were going really well for him and then I think it was 1832 they said there was a big, uh, was it cholera? Cholera out there? Yeah, cholera outbreak that uh, killed like 500 people <laughs> in, in the town and um, naturally that put a bit of a dent into his patronage. <laughs> But he he hung in there and he stuck it out and was able eventually able to uh, get back in the black and then he went on to start a second restaurant even more uh, high end more fine dining so he became this well known figure who had both black and white friends and he was very popular with um, uh, politicians of the day they frequented his restaurants a lot. Um, I can only imagine what he must have been privy to because I, I can see there were probably a lot of important conversations that were going down in his restaurant because that just seems to be the way that, that politicians will come in and you know you get comfortable with some food and some drinks and I'm sure things that were probably more <laughs> national security level these days would probably be thrown about back then. He was not for colonization but he had friends on, like I said, both uh, white and black communities that did support it, which I, th I thought was odd that uh, he had white friends <laughs> that were fans of this idea of sending everybody back, um, but it's just the way things were. There was him, and then um, the other major person they talk about in this book is uh, Francis Scott Key of the Star Spangled Banner fame. He's another one <laughs> that's gonna probably be kind of hard for people um, to uh, accept. Because I'm trying to figure out how to say it. One of the hard parts about getting more and more into history is the more nonfiction history books you read, the more you go up against people that you were raised to admire, <laughs> and, um, you're going to find more and more books that are going to show you who they were in their off time. And the case with Francis Scott Key is I remember he was, he was one of those figures that um, I grew up in school with, with these lessons of, oh yeah, he created the Star Spangled Banner and there was this big epic scene where he, you know, saw the rockets, red glare and all of that and, and teachers instill this sense of patriotism in you with his story and then you <laughs> pick up a book like this in your adulthood and you find out, dude was not okay. He was, I'm not saying he was a terrible person, but he had questionable morals. I'm s the thing I went back and forth with this is he, he, here's the tough part about Francis Scott Key in this book is they talk about his early career where he was at least on a public level, he did seem to support the black community and former slaves and they talk about how uh, in his early career, he would actually um, represent them as a, a defense attorney and um, try to help slaves that hadn't quite gotten their freedom. He would go to court with them and try to get their freedom. And he did all these things on a public level, but there are examples that are given in this book where it shows when he wasn't in the courthouse, um, when he wasn't in public, his off time actions spoke a little bit differently and the 
older he got, the further he got in his career, he turned more and more away from the defense end of things and more and more into the prosecuting end of things. Uh, as far as, if you weren't aware, he, he was a lawyer as a profession. And <sighs> that's kind of where I struggled with. I, I was trying to make sense of this when I was reading it. And so I thought I would share uh, a little bit of uh, what I was looking at that I was kind of debating back and forth with. And I, once I read these couple passages, I think I got an idea of what was going on. So starting off, it said, um, so this section is speaking on uh, Key's early part of his career. Um, when I was talking about he was um, seen more as a defense lawyer for uh, former slaves. It goes on to say, um, it says, Key prided himself as a humanitarian and as a young lawyer relished defending individual colored people in court. Some even called him the Black's lawyer. At the same time, he shared a general view of the free people of color as shiftless and untrustworthy, a nuisance, if not a menace, to white people. He spoke publicly of Africans in America as a distinct and inferior race of people, which all experience proves to be the greatest evil that afflicts a community. He nurtured a vision, expressed in deed, though not in song, in which African colonization would solve the problem of the free blacks by helping them emigrate to Liberia. So he was on the side of, hey, we can fix all this discomfort if we just get them all off our continent. Um, but. Like I said, in public, he was still going to court and defending them and accepting this, graciously, this um, title of being the Black's lawyer, even though, like I said, in his off time, he was spouting all this other stuff. This, this line made me cringe a little bit when I read it. It said, in his relations with enslaved people, he was decent by the standards of the day, which is not really saying much. Then, then it has this story of, um, how he grew up on a plantation that uh, owned slaves. And it said, his mother read the Bible to the blacks in residence. Family lore held that his grandmother had been blinded by smoke while rescuing a black family from a fire. He abhorred the mistreatment of bondsmen and the sundering of families by slave dealers. A prim man, a prim man he was incapable of brutality. Condescension came more easily. During his lifetime, he freed seven of his slaves. He said that all but one of them, whom he did not identify, had thrived in freedom. But in general, he expressed disappointment at the result of his efforts on behalf of colored people. I have thus, inst I have thus been instrumental in liberating several large families and many individuals, he told a contemporary. I cannot remember more than two instances out of this large number in which it did not appear that the freedom so earnestly sought for them was their ruin. He concluded that Negroes could not handle the responsibilities of liberty in America. When they had moved back to Africa, the, the United States would then be free of slaves and former slaves and could thus fulfill its destiny as a land of the free for white people. And then it goes on to talk about how he was uh, in favor of colonization. So I was reading that and when I was at that point in the book, I was just, I was trying to make sense of it because he, was defending them in court. He had talked about how he had freed his own slaves, but he was saying these things in public about how we just needed to get them all off the continent and all that. And I was just thinking, what is going on with this guy? I got to a little bit further in the book and um, this helped me a little bit better. I'm gonna find this section here. It goes on in here to talk about how um, there's more to the Star Spangled Banner than what most American citizens are taught now. Uh, there, I think there's a, at the beginning of this book, there is a um, print of all the stanzas together, uh, which goes, it's, I think basically we just do the first stanza as our national anthem now. Um, but there's like three more in here and uh, one of the things Morley talks about is there's a line in, I think it's the third stanza maybe, he says, um, 
In the third verse, for example, Key's lyrics condemned the African Americans who dared to join the British cause to escape bondage, declaring, no refuge could save the hireling and slave from the terrors of flight or the gloom of the grave. By the end of Key's fourth stanza, the defensive hopes of the first have swelled into a celebration of just war that promised America would go, from, go on from near defeat to a godly conquest. So it's just conveniently dropped off <laughs> that there was a pretty racist line right in what became our national anthem. There's also the bit about um, Key being really buddy-buddy with his brother-in-law, Roger. Is it Roger Taney? I'm trying, I was trying to remember the first name. I think it's Roger Taney. That uh, was another lawyer that became famous for the uh, Dred Scott case. also a uh, South Carolina law that got passed that Taney um, backed that basically said that black sailors that came into port could legally be arrested once their foot got off their boat and onto the dock just because pretty much <laughs> uh, yeah so when you're buddy buddy with that kind of guy it, it doesn't bode well for you trying to come back and saying no I'm a friend of the black people uh, I just, the more I got into this, the more I kept picturing uh, Key being one of those people that you see nowadays that are like, I have tons of black friends. Some of my best friends are black friends. <laughs> uh, just like really, you know, especially saying it with like their voice going up doesn't, you know, doesn't come on. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it just, the more I got into this, I was just like, what is going on with this guy? Um, and I, you know, when I read that part earlier about uh, Key growing up the, on the plantation and people saying that uh, his preferred weapon was condescension, not really, you know, like bodily force or, or strong will or anything, I just, I came to the conclusion that Key probably didn't have much of a backbone. And he... I don't, know, I don't know, maybe in his early moments, in his early days, maybe he had some conscience left and uh, that's when he was doing his defense attorney stuff and maybe he just became more and more bitter and more and more prejudiced as he got older, having the influence of Taney and all these other people in his life and saying, you know what, they are inferior people. And just hearing that more and more throughout his lifetime, maybe he just kind of went with the popularity crowd and said, yes, that is what I believe as well. And, and when you convince yourself enough of something, you start to fight for it even stronger, even though you might not remember what your basis was, just because you've had the influence of so many people telling you that's what you should believe. Uh, I think maybe something like that happened with Key, uh, just because it doesn't, it's, with him it's not as clear cut as to what happened, how he switched sides. Especially that part that's talking about how he grew up on a plantation where his family was slave owners, but they, not that there's like a good slave owner, but they seem to be more on the side of uh, treating people as decently as they could in the situation. You know, they weren't, from what I read, they didn't seem to be the type that viciously beat and starved and, and otherwise abused uh, slaves. Um, so, I don't know. I just, I, I didn't always know what to make of him. <coughs> um, other than I came out at the end of it not really liking him. Um, especially when it gets into the story about the other big case that is brought out other than Beverly Snow, Arthur Bowen. And um, 
what's his name, Crandall, uh, Richard, is it Richard Crandall? I forget the guy's first name. Reuben Crandall. The thing with Arthur Bowen is he uh, was a slave that was owned by Anna Thornton, who was the uh, wife of, um, I'm forgetting everybody's first name, hold on. Um, William. She was the wife of William Thornton, who designed the Capitol building in DC. And William Thornton was a slaveholder who was also in favor of colonization. By the time the uh, Arthur Bowen case came around, I think William Bowen had, William Thornton had passed away, but um, there was a rumor going around for some years that people speculated that William Thornton was actually the father of Arthur, Arthur, I don't know why that's so hard for me to say all of a sudden, Arthur Bowen, uh, who was the son of Maria, who was the house servant to Anna Thornton. If <laughs> you kept up with all that. Um, <clears throat> and there was a um, incident that's discussed in this book about how um, Arthur had, it, it was one of the situations where there were a number of things going on in Arthur's mind that he was upset about. And it just sort of culminated this one night in this incident where he, I think he had been, might've been drinking that night. Um, and he came into Anna Thornton's room where his mom was also in there, uh, both of them asleep. And he, <coughs> he held an ax over the sleeping figure of Anna Thornton. Anna wakes up, screams, uh, and uh, then Maria wakes up and she sees what's going on. So she tries to rush Arthur out of the room and out of the house, but he is eventually captured. And um, <coughs> Anna, <coughs> sorry, <laughs> vocal cords getting dried out. Uh, Anna, uh, she doesn't hold on to any grudge. She, um, she's grown up, she's known Arthur as he's grown up and she doesn't see him as a bad guy. She wants to know what's going on with him. And, but he's, he's already taken to jail um, before she can do much. But she tries to tell the police, no, no, I don't wanna press charges, it's fine. It's just a misunderstanding. And they're like, no, we have to take him in. Uh, and then it turns into this big court case where it's coming out that he tried to murder Anna Thornton. And she um, she actually went to bat for Arthur and uh, she tried to go to all her friends and she actually tried to get Arthur resold, which you know doesn't sound ideal, but she got a word that um, with the things that Key, Key was brought in as a prosecuting attorney on that case. And she said, or she found out that with uh, all the things that Key was putting together, he was gonna seek the death penalty, capital punishment. And so she thought getting him resold would at least save his life. So she tried going to everybody she knew and saying, you know, would you be interested in doing this? Could you do this for me? Uh, and everybody turned her down. So she tried to appeal to Key himself and not surprisingly, Key was like, uh, no, we're going through with this. So she gets even more desperate and she tries to uh, request a meeting with President Andrew Jackson himself through his secretary. And that doesn't really get received. She, she's kind of dismissed from that. And she sits down and writes Andrew Jackson an 18 page letter um, pressing Arthur's case for freedom. And, uh, and on top of that, she had gone around town and collected signatures from people all over town who liked Arthur and supported him and um, agreed that he should be freed. And <laughs> took this 18 page letter and this petition of all these signatures and got in her carriage, rode over to the White House, delivered the letter herself, and basically put herself in Andrew Jackson's face and said, hear me out. <laughs> and 
uh, he just, Andrew Jackson just got to a point where he's, he was just like, you know what, I just, I don't want to hear any more about it. So, uh, can you just go with it? Just what, yes, go with it. Let him go. <laughs> um, so Key's a little ticked off by all this, but mm -hmm, you don't really argue with the president when he's your boss. So uh, then Key get, also gets brought in on the Reuben Crandall case, who Reuben Crandall was a guy that was brought in on charges of distributing anti-slavery pamphlets. And um, again, he is is brought in as the prosecuting attorney trying to go for full charges and one of the things that uh, I cracked up about was uh, they document the case in here they describe this this uh, scene during this trial where Key's own words are used against him in defense of Crandall which <laughs> was like when I was reading it I was like that's kind of awesome um, but it says um so this is the point where uh, Key has given his statements in the Crandall case and he turns it over to de the defense and it says, Key gave way to the defense. Richard Cox's junior counsel, Joseph Bradley Rose. Without introduction, he starts reading from another pamphlet lamenting the cruelties of the slave trade. When Judge Cranch interrupted to ask him about the relevance, Bradley replied that the words actually came from the lips of the district attorney. He was quoting, he said, from Key's address to the American Colonization Society in 1827, in which Key had cited the abuses of inherent in slavery as justification for helping blacks move to Africa. At the other table, Key was not amused. So, <laughs> he, um, so basically they're saying that Key was working as the uh, prosecuting attorney in this case for a guy that was being accused of distributing anti-slavery propaganda or pamphlets. And the defense came back and used Key's own words talking about the abhorrence of slavery and saying, you said these words yourself, so what is your case <laughs> uh, knocking this guy for doing the same thing? Uh, so <laughs> I thought I cracked up when uh, it said Key was not amused because I could just picture Key's face just in there. <laughs> it goes on to say that Crandall wrote to his brother during this case, watching things go back and forth. And in the letter, he says, the evidence for the prosecution was the most confused mess you ever saw. <laughs> but the, um, the race riot part of this book comes in during the uh, Crandall trial because uh, a white mob came together uh, around Crandall, but they couldn't get to Crandall because Crandall had been taken to jail. So they went after Beverly Snow. So it comes back around to Snow. And um, the reason they went after Snow was that there were these rumors going around that Snow had uh, said these disparaging or, or um, lewd remarks about white women in DC. And so they thought that <laughs> that was legitimate enough to ruin the guy's family and business. Um, which, you know, keep in mind, it was just rumor. But uh, people thought that there was uh, significance or legitimate legitimacy behind it because um, there were, <laughs> over the years, Snow had developed some enemies with, you know, being a biracial man who had come out of slavery and had become a successful business owner and um, you know he was proud of his successes and some people read that as him being cocky so there were a lot of people that were just sort of bugged by him to begin with and then when these rumors started up which were probably started by people that were already not fans of his. They were like, oh, well, you know, <laughs> we're vindicated then. Uh, so they go and attack uh, Snow's residence and his business. They don't get to Snow, but they do damage his restaurant. But the thing I thought was kind of funny is they said the mob gets to the restaurant and is basically ransacking the place, but they're instructed not to break any of the furniture because it was believed that the furniture in the restaurant was actually owned by a white business owner who was leasing it to uh, 
snow. So they're like, oh, well, because this is owned by white people, don't mess this up, but you know, whatever else you want to do. So um, that's starting on one side. And then they're also talking about um, race riots going on um, within uh, white areas. There were uh, former slaves, freed slaves that were going after white families. Um, there was a, uh, they said there was an uprising in Southampton, Virginia. Um, there was an uprising there of former slaves who massacred entire white families. I thought I would share chapter 30 in here. It's pretty short, but it gives you an idea of what was going on um, as far as the climate in town when all these trials were going down. It said, the events of August 1835 would soon be dubbed the Snow Riot or Snowstorm in recognition of the central role that Beverly Snow's singular personality played in igniting popular passion. But the breakdown in order was not simply a loss of control as implied by the word riot, nor a natural phenomenon as implied by the word storm. The mobs of Washington, D.C. chose their targets, discerning observers noticed. Margaret Bayard Smith, Anna Thornton's good friend and chronicler of Washington society, noted that the anger of whites could be traced to events several days before Snow allegedly made his salacious jape. The disturbances, she wrote, originated during the hunt for Arthur Bowen. The constable in seeking him made some discoveries about the colored people that alarmed the public and gave rise to the disturbances that ensued, she wrote. Four men who were ob objects of greatest indignation have fled the city. Smith did not identify the four offenders, but noted they posed no threat to public safety, only to white people's feelings of superiority. No insurrection against the whites was seriously apprehended, she wrote, but insolence, insubordination, and contempt have been exhibited that were certainly sufficient to excite the indignation that existed and called for punishment, though everyone regrets that a mob should assume the right of inflicting it. The constable who did the discovering of insolence, insubordination, and contempt was Madison Jeffers, the man who had arrested Arthur Bowen on Saturday, and then Reuben Crandall on Monday. It was, Jefferson, it was Jeffers who incited the crowd against Randall by telling them about the pamphlets. Many a white man shared his indignation. Beverly Snow, who had offered to quell any talk of insurrection among the blacks, was now a target of the whites. So was John Cook, perhaps the most educated black man in the city. One mob marched up the avenue to 14th Street and then north to 8th Street, where his school was located. Cook, too, had expected trouble and made himself scarce. He mounted his horse, stabled at the house of a white friend, and sped north in the night, heading for Pennsylvania. The mechanics engulfed his schoolhouse, destroying all the books and furniture. They started to tear down the building itself when they were challenged by Edward Dyer, a white man and auctioneer who also served as alderman for the Second Ward. Dyer planted himself between the mob and the house, and the attackers moved on. Another gang of white men invaded the boarding house, room of a free man of color named John James Hutton. Ironically, Francis Scott Key had helped Hutton win his freedom a decade before with a clever legal argument. At the time, Hutton was a servant owned by a naval officer named Bell. Hutton had served Bell on a Navy ship during an overseas tour of duty, but since official regulations forbade the use of slaves on Navy ships, Hutton was paid for his work. Upon their return to the U.S., Hutton filed a suit for his freedom saying, the fact that he had been paid meant that he was no longer a slave. Key, in his self-appointed role as the blacks lawyer, submitted a letter to the court saying that Hutton's paid tour of duty amounted to implied manumission. The court ruled in his favor and Hutton became a free man in 1825. Ten years later, the rampaging mob ransacked his room and found a copy of The Emancipator, one of the sheets that Reuben Crandall had brought to town. A constable Accompanying the mob took this as proof that Hutton was in league with Crandall and hustled him off to jail amidst cries that he be lynched too. Another mob went after William Worley, Wor Wormley, the livery stable owner who had been friends with William Lloyd Garrison when the abolitionist editor lived in Washington. Wormley's sister Mary had run another school for Negro children on Vermont Avenue before falling ill and passing away a few months before. A teacher friend of the Wormleys named William Thomas Lee had taken over the school. The mob came from Wormley, 
and Lee, and they fled the city. Wormley's schoolhouse was trashed as well. Another target was a William Jackson, who worked as a messenger at the post office and supported abolition. It seems there was some danger of the mob getting a hold of him, a colleague recounted. He's been a great patron of the abolition, abolition journals and used to get a leave of absence every summer to attend the Negro Congress in Philadelphia. Jackson, too, had to clear out. The only Negro school that was spared was Louise Park's Louise Park. Hostin's Academy on A Street on Capitol Hill, and it wasn't hard to figure out why. Her father was William Costin, the most respected free Negro in town. He, he was close to the family of Martha Washington, avoided involvement in abolition activities, and worked as a porter for rich men at the, Black, at the Bank of Washington. Costin's friendships with leading white men gave him a degree of protection, and the mob recognized it by staying away from his daughter's school. The pattern of the disorder indicates the white mob tormenting Washington City in August 1835 was not out of control and not solely concerned with Everly Snow. The mechanics did not attack all free blacks in all schools. They pursued the small group of black men who were doing the most to undermine the slave system in the seat of the American government. The snowstorm was not just a riot, it was also a manhunt. So there were these pockets of riots going on throughout town um, but they're saying that it it was believed that the majority of the targets were planned it wasn't just people ransacking the entire town although I'm sure people getting caught up in the heat of the moment some innocents were probably caught up in the storm but the majority of the rioting was targeted incidents the carnage continued into the night, a display of ferocity that was directed at free blacks, but also meant to send a message to all the people of the city. The mechanics would be heard. In the words of the Metropolitan, the populace of Washington, once elevated into the dignity of a sovereign mob, seemed resolved not to separate without giving the remaining inhabitants convincing proof of their power and letting them feel the blessings of their sway. The mob would teach the city and its leaders a lesson. He himself was targeted. One gang gathered around his house on C Street and noisily reviled him as an abolitionist, which he most certainly was not. The crowd might have sacked the home had it not been for the presence of armed guards. Mercifully, his wife Polly and the younger children were safe at Terra Rubra. Yeah, Rubra. Which is their, um, I think, like one of their country estates. Um, other marauders wandered around town taking their pleasure. The property of every colored person who rendered themselves obnoxious to them was devoted to destruction, said the Metropolitan. The African churches and schools shared a similar fate, and then the insurrectionary and violent spirit, which was prevalent, singled out other objects on which to wreak its fury. The Intelligencer, which is a um, newspaper they talk about a bit in this book, noted that the mob had burned a house of ill fame in the first ward that was frequented by blacks. The Globe chastely reported that they had set fire to a hut whose proprietor was an old Negro woman and a regular conjurer of the blacks of the city, a veiled way of saying she was a madam. The assailants' goals, their pleasure, was to annihilate the black man's playground. They dragged the beds and the chairs of the body house out into the open. They smashed these cradles of paid love into kindling, and then they piled it high and torched the whole building. The result was a gigantic bonfire that could be seen a mile and a half away from City Hall. When the sentries for the militia saw the light of the flames in the western sky, Mayor Bradley and General Jones led a patrol to investigate. The, arms, the armed men went out onto the avenue, past the darkened presidential mansion, and into, into the first ward in the area now known as Foggy Bottom, and found the site of the blaze. The fire had burned down to cinders. The house of ill fame was no more. The whores, their customers, and the arsonists had all vanished. Even the conjurer was gone. Then there was a, another section in here, I think also from the intelligencer, a quote they pulled uh, that said, um, black people had found themselves facing a new wave of legal harassment and social ostracism. We have already had too many free Negroes and mulattoes in the city, said an anonymous letter in the Intelligencer. The policy of our corporate authorities should tend to the diminution of this insolent class. <clears throat> a motion is now before the Common Council for prohibiting shop license henceforth to this class of people. 
If they wish to live here, let them become subordinates and laborers as nature designed. The Common Council passed the new ordinance barring blacks from shop licenses. So that's what Beverly Snow was up against. He fled the city trying to save his life and his family. And uh, when he came back into town, he found this ordinance that said that um, all black citizens would be barred from having uh, business licenses within the city. So um, then we see that Beverly Snow is <laughs> left with no choice but to be forced out of the city and start his businesses elsewhere. Uh, so it's just, it's a very dramatic and, and painful story uh, to go through, but um, this book is fascinating though. It does read really well for uh, a history book. Um, the pace is really nice. It's very descriptive. It's not overly dry. One of the things that uh, I thought was pretty cool though is uh, talking about all the, the riots that were going on. Um, there was a section that goes on to say that um, the riots only ended up strengthening the abolition, abolitionist message, uh, which you wouldn't think <laughs> at first, given uh, all the things that went down. But uh, if you look at the statistics on paper, Morley points out that at the beginning of 1835, when all of these riots were popping up, um, there were 200? I think he said about 200 abolitionist groups across the nation. By the end of that year, it had gone up to 527. By the end of 1837, just a couple years later, there were a thousand abolitionist groups across the country. So more and more, the message was getting across that this was ridiculous, this is not how you should treat people, y'all should be ashamed of yourselves, <laughs> and groups kept growing to fight this problem. Um, which I thought was, was pretty cool. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, cool side history in this book that, uh, that uh, was pretty interesting. Uh, one of the things I thought was, uh, kind of funny, it was reading about, um, the story behind the Star Spangled Banner and how it actually ended up being sort of a reputation saver for Francis Scott Key after he had a bit of an embarrassing show <laughs> in the uh, War of 1812. You're given this look at the country just prior to the War of 1812, where um, our government declared war on the British, uh, which they, they were complaining of taxes, uh, but I also thought it was weird that they said that uh, one of the determining factors for declaring war was they said that Britain was stealing our sailors. Like people were going overseas and, and um, fighting for the Queen's Navy rather than ours, which I thought was odd. <laughs> um, but that was one of the things that, that stirred this, this fight. The War of 1812 gets declared. Um, troops are put together. Uh, Key serves as a lieutenant in the, which militia? I blinked. Which militia was he in? Georgetown. <laughs> Key was a lieutenant in the Georgetown militia. And uh, so he's he's in charge of a certain number of men. And, uh, and then uh, we also uh, hear the story behind uh, General Winder. Is that his name? William Winder. I think. I think Madison, James Madison was the president at this point. Um, Madison puts Winder in charge of basically the entire operation um, once they get word that the British invasion is coming. Wait, oh yes, wait a minute, Mr. Bozeman. Wait, wait, hey, 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 Mr. Bozeman. Not the, the one a little bit before that one. Yeah. <laughs> So he puts Winder in charge. Problem was, Winder had never really been in, put in charge of troops over like a thousand, I think it was. Uh, and then when the War of 1812 happened, he was suddenly in charge of like 10,000 plus men. <laughs> and it was, it was a little overwhelming for him uh, to have all of that responsibility. 
uh, amplified on him. So the militia, our, our army, sets up in um, Bladensburg. I think that's the name? Um, am I saying that town right? Bladensburg? Bladensburg, Maryland, which is just outside of the DC area. And uh, the our forces see the British coming and basically freak the fuck out. <laughs> and uh, it ends up being this sort of embarrassing show on our end that gets dubbed the Bladensburg races. And uh, Key was a part of that uh, as far as the whole, our troops basically turning around and running. <laughs> um, so Key's name being associated with that, he needed sort of a reputation saver. So when years later, when he came out with the Star Spangled Banner, that ended up being a way for him to kind of get a little bit of credit back. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of an interesting story in there. The other um, kind of cool thing in here, if you're the type of person that likes, you know, getting to the end of the story and saying, well, what happened to them years later kind of thing, um, there, there is a nice bit of a epilogue work in here where Morley wraps things up and says, um, he just gives you the, the numbers rundown of, of what it ended up looking like uh, a few years down the road. In 1830, the opponents of slavery had no national organization, no champion in the popular press or the Christian pulpit. By 1836, the names of William Lloyd Garrison and Arthur Tappan were known across the land. Reuben Crandall was at least for a few weeks a nationally known martyr for the cause. And on the eastern shore of Maryland, a young enslaved man about the same age as Arthur Bowen made his first attempt to escape from bondage. His name was Frederick Douglass. Within a decade, he would become the movement's most famous black leader. In 1830, the pa this goes back and forth to show you um, how, how much advancement had been made. So he goes back to 1830 to show you uh, where we were at and then uh, another feature of of the movement and then gives you another year to show you what advancement had been made in that respect. So that's why I keep saying in 1830. Uh, in 1830, the free people of Washington, D.C. and the rest of the United States were politically isolated and inert. That began to change with the emergence of the anti-colonization movement that met at the AME Church on Capitol Hill in April 1831. Simultaneous emergence of the Negro Convention movement joined by the likes of John Cook created a national network of activists seeking to improve the condition of black people by education and immigration. With the arrival of Ben Lundy in 1831, blacks and whites were starting to make common cause in the struggle against slavery. In 1830, the African colonization was the most plausible and appealing proposal to ameliorate the problem of slavery in America. By 1836, the idea of universal emancipation had eclipsed colonization, popularity, and influence. In the interim, the upstart of the American Anti-Slavery Society had attracted more followers, formed more chapters, and collected more money than the well-entrenched American Colonization Society. Along the way, the African colonization scheme lost its reputation as the most realistic way to handle the bondage of several million people of African descent. Among blacks, the idea of emigrating from the United States retained appeal as long as people of color, not the slaveholders and their allies, would determine the destination. They chose Canada or the Caribbean much more often than they chose Africa. The colonization society outdid its more radical rival in one area only, supported, by, supported from elected officials. For example, Congressman Lincoln, while he loathed slavery, was politically ambitious and prejudiced against blacks. He declared himself a supporter of African colonization, and he would remain one even after he was elected president two decades later. Again, that's another thing I was talking about, was getting into history um, and finding out some of the people that you were raised to admire. They actually didn't always knock it out of the park. Uh, Lincoln is another one. Lincoln is someone that I grew up um, really admiring and reading a lot about. And uh, on one end, I do still respect a lot of what he did, but I also have history books that and um, letters that uh, he wrote that point out that he wasn't the um, almighty deity of of abolition the way he was painted. He, I mean, he did bring about that idea when he was office, but 
some of the history books I've read, and when you get into the letters and things that he wrote, uh, it wasn't a clear-cut case for him. He didn't just decide one day that, you know, this needed to end. He went back and forth a lot for a long time about whether he should do it or not because he knew he was going to have a lot of supporters against him. It was expensive. It, he knew going in that it was likely going to start a war. Uh, he just, and he, he flip-flopped a lot and he had moments where he was like, uh, you know, maybe I won't. <laughs> um, and like they say in here, he did have actions now and then where you would be surprised for a man that, you know, brought about the, the idea of freeing the slaves, the thing he's most known for now, he had moments where he would say things where you're like, that's, that's kind of messed up, dude. That's, I don't think that's real tactful. Um, so it's just, like I said, it's part of that thing about being a history nerd that gets annoying. It's like, you feel like it's hard to find people that you can really fully admire and not run into faults with. But I mean, it's, it's human nature, but it just, it feels worse when it's like people from history that you greatly admire and then you're up against human nature, but it's like the faults they make were big ones though. Uh, so yeah, something I struggle with all the time. But in April, 1862, Lincoln seeking to fortify the capital and gain advantage over the Confederacy's army oversaw the abolition of slavery in the District of Columbia. Eight months later on January 1st, 1863, he issued the Emancipation Proclamation abolishing slavery in the rest of the country and settling finally the issue of whether emancipation or colonization was more realistic. Emancipation was. You know, when you get into history, you learn that just because the Emancipation Proclamation came out, um, it didn't fix everything immediately. There was a lot of backlash when he released that. A lot of angry people. I mean guy was assassinated. <laughs> um, so it, it, it was a gradual process. Um, but this gives you an idea of like, we were getting there. And it is inspiring to think that, you know, even though <laughs> it is kind of nice to look back at this now, um, because there are plenty of times now where I look at the news and look at where we're going and I feel like we're backtracking a lot. So looking at this kind of stuff helps to remind us that if we start to fall back, we can get there again if we just remember and educate ourselves. There's another section in here that said, few could imagine the possibilities in 1836, but within a generation, the proud and vehement defenders of slavery in Washington, D.C. would be vanquished, self-exiled from Congress, defeated in national elections, and then on the battlefield. Within half a lifetime, the genius of universal emancipation, once touted by only a few dreamers, like Ben Lundy, Isaac Carey, and John Cook, would become national policy in the Emancipation Proclamation and the constitutionally sanctioned right to due process. These ideas did not prevail simply because they were just or because of the might of the Union Army or the leadership of Abraham Lincoln. They prevailed because they were practical and attractive to growing numbers of Americans. Um, one of the other features I like in this book is there's a postscript section if you're curious about um, who ended up where, um, like individual people mentioned in this book, uh, Morley gives you a breakdown of um, where everybody ended up up to their, their deaths. Uh, and also, um, I think he talks about um, different uh, laws and things that were brought up um, in the aftermath of all this. But but he breaks it down into who, when, where, and so um, this I thought was pretty cool. On the where section, this tells you um, like the, the homes and the buildings and things they talk about in this book, whether they're still standing and where you can go see them if they are. Uh, so like um, a couple in here say, um, 
The Riverside Tract on Falls Street in Georgetown, where Key lived from 1806 to 1835, is now a park named in his honor. A plaque in the park states inaccurately <laughs> that Key was active in anti-slavery causes. The center market between 7th and 9th Streets in Pennsylvania Avenue, where Anna Thornton and Maria Bowen did their shopping, is now the site of the National Archives. William Thornton's Capitol building, topped with a dome after the Civil War, remains in use by the United States Congress. Which, obviously. <laughs> um, so that just gives you um, a couple ideas. I mean, there's a list of them in here, but that's just a few of the things. If you're curious, there's also a sample of one of uh, Beverly Snow's menus in here of what he... Um, you, the, so you can get an idea of what the kind of stuff he used to serve in his restaurant. Um, oh, I forgot to mention, also, if you're reading this and you get confused about where everybody is going, there is a map on both the um, back flap and the front flap. I think it's the same map. Uh, so, depending on where you are in the book, whichever is easier to flip to, that is uh, in there to keep track of. So, I think that is finally it, guys. <laughs> uh, I told you there was a lot of history to cover in there. <clears throat> so, yeah. Um, I just thought I would talk about this and bring it up and just, you know, another something to think about and be aware of because I do feel uh, in recent years we have backtracked a little bit on... Um, you know, the, the color barrier and race relations and things like that. I feel like, at least lately, it feels like you get a few steps forward and then a half a dozen steps back and then we can make a little progress. But um, especially with our president now, we have to keep aware of um, what our history was because y'all know he's not gonna read it <laughs> so we have to read it for ourselves and be educated ourselves um until we can get at least a little bit less of a dumbass <laughs> in charge of things uh so yeah read educate yourself uh this is a good one to pick up um you know, you might not love, might not agree with everything that goes down in here, but if nothing else, it is a fascinating history to be aware of. And like I said, it does read pretty nicely for a nonfiction work. And I have been seeing that topic go around a lot on Facebook, or not Facebook, uh, BookTube lately about people looking for um, good places in nonfiction to start. So here you go. <laughs> so that's all I have for this video, guys. We will see you in the next one and we will talk soon.